The other big thing I'll mention on is some swing characteristics that can cause injury. The first big one is early extension, which is practically where the hips get closer towards the ball prior to impact. From here, it puts our body in a position where our back is arching, it's side bending, and also we're rotating at the same time, which puts the back tissues, particularly on the trail side, in a lot of stress. That is one position I like to see controlled. The second position I see quite a lot of is the over the top move, so where people look like they're cutting wood versus the lead hip starting to rotate first. And another big injury area I see in the golf swing is the dreaded chicken wing. What happens in the chicken wing, instead of that lead arm starting to straighten and extend, it starts to flex. As our arm starts to bend, the muscles in our elbows have to control the club face even harder, which over time can lead into stress, in particular, tennis elbow. Hi, this is Pam Johnson from Tallahassee, Florida, and I play at Southwood Golf Club. This is Golf Smarter number 918. Why you shouldn't carry your golf bag and other preventable golf injuries with Billy Troy. This is Golf Smarter sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Billy. Thank you, Fred. I really appreciate you having me on, mate. I'm looking forward to talk about all things golf fitness and physical therapy. Yeah, and I love getting the fact that you're, what part of Australia are you in? Yeah, currently based in Brisbane, in, in the north of Australia, so it's getting into our warmer season here, and um, lots of golf happening, mate, so I'm very happy to be here. How did you become a golf physio, physical therapist? Is that what your title is? Yeah, that's my title. So I guess as a, a young kid, I played a lot of golf, a lot of uh, rugby league, one of our main sports here in Australia. And um, as I got older, I started to back the rugby leg down. I, I got sick of getting bashed up by bigger guys than me <laughs> and um, <laughs> started to play a bit more golf. And I, I guess after I finished my physical therapy degree, I blended the two passions together. And, and here I am now about five years later. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, you gave me a list of topics that you'd like to discuss, which I truly appreciate. Thank you very much. Um, and... The first one you have here are back pain myths. Now, I've had uh, back pain all, most of my adult life, and it's going on decades and decades now of back pain, but I do at least 20 minutes stretching every single morning, um, especially the mornings that, um, you know, that, uh, that I'm going to play golf. I also luckily enough to have a hot tub. So I, before I even start stretching, I get warmed up in the tub, warm the body up. Um, but you're saying there's myths about back pain in golf. Let's address that first. For sure. And and well done on your warm-up procedures, mate. You probably beat 70% of my clients by doing stretching. So um, that's, that's a great start. <laughs> I've always loved you. <laughs> Good. Good. So. That's, that's a great place to start. And uh, I guess with golf, 40% give or take of injuries are, are back pain related. So there's a, a number of myths around that. So I'll just debunk a few of those now and I guess the first thing I see or hear quite a lot is my back is out of alignment so for this I've seen hundreds of golfers with back pain and I've probably seen one or two that are, that are truly out of alignment per se and when people refer to alignment they're talking about the, the bone and, and deformity of the bone and it's very rare that's the case unless you have some form of, of scoliosis, which is where the basically bone will, will deviate in a certain direction. So that's one very common myth. Um, a second common myth is, is that the disc is out of place or the disc popped out in the back. And the disc is essentially a soft tissue that sits between the bones. And again, with, with that, the disc can't physically move out of place. It can, it can protrude and affect the nerves, but it can't physically come out of place. And then um, another one I commonly hear is I need to pop my back back in. So um, chiropractors typically have manipulation techniques and people think they're actually putting the, the joints back into place, whereas actually it's just the joint um, we're releasing air in. So there's some, there's some quick ones to touch on, Fred. Um, yeah, I know someone very close to me has had a, had a herniated disc and had to have surgery twice in the last year. 
Um, and wow. yeah, when, when your disc doesn't pop out, it, if you if your disc popped out, you wouldn't be just complaining about it. You'd be screaming about it, right? Yeah, one hundred percent. And the way the body is made, we've got a lot of these structures that that sit around the disc. So you've got obviously the bones um, surrounding it. You've got a lot of ligaments and soft tissues. So the the disc can't move out. Like you said, her- herniation is basically where the disc will protrude slightly and, and potentially touch on the nerve there. But it's it's not physically possible. So again, some of those quick myths just um, basically touch on uh, a lot of the language that's that's commonly misused. But golfers do get back pain. Yes, sir. So uh, like I, I touched on briefly, about 40%, 40 to 60%, it's a big range, but that's basically what a lot of studies tell us. And one in, one in four golfers will have back pain after their round. So let's say in your group of four, it's likely that one of you are having back pain after the round. So it's, it's a huge number. And I guess one of my big drivers is to try and decrease that so golfers can play as, as long and as healthy as they like. Yeah. And what what do you find to be the cause um, for the back pain? Is, is, it, is it sitting in the golf cart? Is it walking? Is it the golf swing itself? What, do you, uh, what have you discovered? Yeah, there's, there's a number of factors. I'll say the, the big rocks in the jar would be uh, physical fitness. So are you, are you exercising? Um, are you doing some strength training? Secondly, it would be uh, weight management. So if you're overweight, you're likely to, to have back pain. Um, when it comes down to the, the nitty-gritty, so some of the, the things that can impact it, like you mentioned, the golf swing mechanics can certainly affect the back. So um, some recent examples might be Will Zalatoris that gets into a position where the back is arching towards the ball and side-bending quite a lot. So that's a potential position of injury. Um, so they're, they're the, the little ones, but I'd say, like I mentioned, the big rocks in the jar are exercise, weight management, sleep, and, and diet, Fred. Uh, I've noticed that uh, when I start putting on a couple pounds, um, that I'll have a tendency, my back will hurt more. And right now, I am at the lowest weight that I've been since my wedding. <laughs> I mean, I, I've been working really hard on trying to cut back on, on the amount that I'm consuming um, and how many times a day that I eat. And so I'm, being, I'm definitely feeling the impact of not having the extra eight, nine pounds. I mean, that makes a big difference. For sure. And, and do you have a particular exercise routine that you do or is it more just the, the diet focus? Um, well, my exercise is walking and walking a golf course a couple times a week and also the, stre- the morning stretching. But other than that, if, mm. if I go to the gym, which I don't do very often, and I, my wife is going to knock on the door any second and go, why don't you go to the gym today? Uh, it's, I go, I swim. <laughs> That's my primary exercise. The, the gym is all, all swim, which also has helped my back a lot. Good. And, and I'm a big proponent in and exercise uh, what you enjoy as well. So if you enjoy swimming, your yoga, your walking, consistency is key. So even some of my clients, they hate going to the gym. They don't want to use any weights. And I'm fine with that. There's, there's a number of different ways to get a good stimulus for your body. Excellent. Um, another, another thing that uh, on your list of, of topics to discuss kind of leads into this, and we were talking about you know, morning stretching and whatnot, but also uh, getting ready for your round of golf and the reasons why it's important to, to have a warm-up, not just to walk right up to the first tee, right from your car to the pro shop to the first tee. You're probably not going to play as well as you could, I'm assuming, and you have reasons for this. For sure. And there's a number of different reasons. And I, I guess the culture here is typically uh, the player will get to the course. Like you said, they'll, they'll run to the pro shop. They'll pay their grain fees. They might get a coffee and, and, and a meat pie here. And um, they expect to play their best possible golf. And I think it's really good to take some insight from what a lot of the professionals do. So Ryder Cup just recently, you see they had a, a full gym set up. So a lot of the players will go into the gym They'll do some mobility work. They'll do some activation drills with bands, like going through the golf swing movements. And, and that's for a number of reasons, Fred. So firstly, it's an injury management tool. So to play golf as long as possible and, and as long as you'd like to, you need to be able to move well and, and mitigate injuries. 
Secondly, it's a big performance benefit as well. So uh, the Titleist Performance Institute, TPI, did some study around this. If you're doing a five-minute warm-up, you're likely to hit it about five yards longer with every shot. So over a round, uh, that certainly adds up as well. So both of those two reasons is why you should be doing it. You can get increased yardage with just a five-minute warm-up? Yeah, yeah, certainly. So if you type into Google now or into your phone, uh, five-minute warm-up, TPI, I'm sure the article will come up. It's just some quick banded exercises. So doing um, some squats, doing some rotations with a band, essentially doing movements of the golf swing. And because the, the muscles are primed to go, you're likely to hit it further. And I, I guess if we imagine the body as a car, uh, if, if you jump in your car, you put the pedal down, it's likely your car is not going to be prepared to, to go quick and you might, you might hear it a bit noisier than what it typically would. Whereas if you jump into the car, let the motor just churn for a minute or two, the car is better prepared. And our body's pretty similar in that manner. That's why I have an electric car. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to take a time out. We're going to be back right after this. Billy, I want to know, let's go over some specific warm-up drills that are going to help grease (laughs) grease up your body and get you warmed up and get you a couple extra yards. Uh, If you're not going to go hit balls, but you... Even if you are, you still need to do some warm-up drills. Let's let's go over a couple. What do you got? For sure. So some easy ones you can do at, at the course. Um, these ones are a, a good bang for your buck, and, and that's the biggest thing as well with a warm-up. It needs to be easy, quick, and accessible as well. Uh, otherwise, mm-hmm. golfers will make an excuse somewhere to try and avoid it. So if you're at home listening now or at the course or wherever you may be, you can have a golf shaft across your shoulders, get yourself into your golf posture, and I want you just to try and turn your shoulders as far as you can with that golf club across your chest. With each of these exercises, I like around 10 repetitions, two repeats each direction. So that's a really quick and easy one. That's great. The second one, one I like is, yeah, and, and um, with the golf swing, typically the, the rotational centers are where a lot of injuries can come from it. And what I mean by that is the upper back and the hips. These are really the two areas of the body that are rotating quite a lot to create a a good golf swing. So if we're having restrictions in those areas, it's going to A, limit your ability to move, and B, it's going to cause the lower back to become more involved, which we don't want ideally. Right, right. Yeah. So a a few other warm-up stretches you can do is by, secondly, having the, the golf shaft across the front of your hips, and from there, would you like me to go through these as well, Fred, with some demonstrations? Um, if you, it, well, it's an audio podcast, so if the if you use words to describe them, it would be much more effective. Uh, we do put these on social media, so you know the, these short little clips. So if we have something that's visually um, compelling, then we'll use that as well. But try to describe them because most of our audience is. For sure, Listen. for sure. I'll, I'll, I'll um, go through them in terms of, of language and then I can send you some stuff afterwards if you like for your, your um, social media too. Oh, yeah, and I can put those in the show notes. Yeah, Perfect. please. Okay, so uh, back, right. back to the, the second drill. So you can have the golf club across the front of the hips in your golf posture and just trying to complete your backswing and also your impact position with the club there. So trying to rotate as far as you possibly can. One quick stretch I like for just trying to open up the hips as well is put your uh, butt of your golf club on the ground. Your hand will be on top of the iron shaft. And from there, just performing a squat and holding that for 30 seconds. And a lot of people don't realize, but in the golf swing, particularly in the back swing, we're starting to load into a squat-like pattern, similar to someone like Rory McIlroy, for example. He's obviously the poster boy for that squat move in the back swing. So if you have a bit more flexibility there, you're able to maintain that position. And another quick one for your shoulders is just having your hand on top of the iron shaft, have the other hand onto the grip, and just trying to push the hands over your head. So just trying to stretch the lat dorsi muscle, which sits underneath the shoulder there. I like that one. So that one, you're just taking your club and giving some resistance. It's all about resistance, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's right. So moving through resistance so that when we go into our golf swing, we don't have that resistance there or, or less resistance there. Okay. What else? 
more, more, more. <laughs> that, so far, well, we've done well, a, a go three through. minute warm up. I mean, do, how long of warm up should we do for our body, not just hitting balls, but uh, before a round? How long should we spend doing well, I that? like around 10 to 15 minutes. So I like it to be quick, effective, uh-huh. and going through essentially uh, every movement that you have in the golf swing. And also, I can link you to a PDF guide as well, Fred, where it has all the exercises I recommend before a round. Um, some other ones I, I do like if you have access to some exercise bands, some exercise tubing, is having the band underneath your lead foot and from there taking a backswing. So from there, I like to do again, same, same pattern, 10 repetitions, two repetitions each side, really trying to get the core muscles working and prepared for what you're about to do in your, in your golf swing. And then also putting under your trail side and going through the impact position and the follow through. There, there's some quick ones. Some other ones around the body I like is a, a neck stretch, just turning your neck as far as you can, looking down to your underarm, and just pulling your head down gently just so we're stretching those neck muscles around our shoulder. Some other stretches I like to do going around the body is also going into a toe touch. A lot of people here I work with can't touch their toes, so going through that 10 times, and doing the reverse of that, reaching behind the legs, trying to arch that 10 times. But like I mentioned, Fred, uh, those stretches are all in a, a guide that I've got, so I can link you to that so it's it's easy and uh, we've got visual demonstrations for that too. Oh, that's great. And we'll, we'll, uh, we, I appreciate that very much, and we will put that in the show notes and in the blog post so that people can download that for free. Um, I want to go back to the exercise band. Um, give me a another explanation of it so you put the exercise band around your foot and then go through the golf swing but you're holding the band down on the ground with your foot and pulling through is did i interpret that properly yeah that's right so you have it under your foot either you can tie or just stamp on one end of the band you have the other band in two hands Mm -hmm. and just completing your backswing so you have that anchor point is your foot obviously the other anchor point is your hands and just going through the golf swing uh, gently. So what that enables you to do is all these muscles that are working, we're just trying to engage them. And uh, what we know about physiotherapy or physical therapy is if you're strong and resilient, um, there's a very good chance of, of limiting injuries. So that's, that's really important before you take to the tee or even to your practice tee. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I'm sure that you don't advocate drinking alcohol on the golf course, (laughs) but that's a hard one to tell people not to do. Um, So let's keep it at uh, walking the golf course versus riding in a buggy, as you would say. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, in terms of alcohol, uh, if you're having a good time and and that's how you play your best golf, go for it. Um, It's probably not the best and how sure are you you're playing your best golf with the alcohol? Try it without the alcohol and see what happens. You might get bored, but... <laughs> I certainly agree. I don't think it's the best performance tool, but um, each to their own. But like you, like you said, Fred, um, walking the golf course versus a cart, I think there is some huge benefits behind that. And you referenced back pain earlier. In a, in a golf cart, a couple of things are happening. Firstly, you're going over paths and potholes and the cart will be bouncing up and down. So in that instance, yeah, yeah, in that instance, your back and your upper back and neck are taking quite a lot of that pressure. Whereas when you're walking, obviously you're absorbing the force through your ankles, your knees, your hips, and it's getting dispersed equally throughout the body. And the second thing, when you're in a cart, you're locked into this sitting position, our shoulders are slumped forward, which is the complete opposite of what we want to do in the golf swing. Whereas, again, if you're walking, you're up nice and tall, and a lot of those muscles aren't getting into those compromised positions. It's so true. So true. Um, when you're walking, now I walk and I push, uh, I have a push cart, three-wheel push cart that I use. I cannot carry a golf bag over 18 holes. Uh, it just, I, I, I just think my back would tighten up. It would be... Uh, it, you know, it compresses everything if I'm trying to carry my golf bag. Is there any research um, or, or studies done on the impact of carrying your bag versus not carrying your bag? 
option. Yeah, there certainly is, Fred. And I'm the same as you, mate. So when I carry a golf bag, I, I tighten up. I feel tired. And um, an interesting story, earlier this year, I was living in an apartment complex and I used to leave my, my push cart where I park my car. And I went to golf one afternoon and someone had push, uh, stolen my push cart. No. So I thought, okay, well, I'm... <laughs> so I thought, I guess I'm carrying today. And I was playing just nine holes. And after the nine holes, I found I was so fatigued, I was really stiff in the shoulders and neck. And that was just for, for the nine. But going on to some studies, so there was one interesting study published, I think it was 2016, but they were comparing the oxygen consumption of pushing your bag versus carrying, which is, which is basically um, the energy expenditure. So what they found, if you carry your golf bag, you're expending about 10% more energy. So again, if you're playing golf and you're trying to play your best golf, Conserving energy is really important for firstly, uh, the physical move of the golf swing. Secondly, mentally as well, we need to make sure that we're on point. And especially if you're playing in an environment where it's warm as well, extra energy is going to be an extra sweat, which is going to mean obviously that dehydration factor as well. Secondly, with carrying your golf bag is like we've just talked about is, is the physical part of it as well. So in terms of the muscles. So, again, carrying a, a 10 to 20 ba- pound bag on your back or more, it, it's going to weigh down quite literally and, and, and metaphorically as well. So, again, for me, it's it's always always push. And, and even on that, um, some people like to pull their bag behind them. I much prefer them to push it in front of them. With that, your posture is up taller. You're not getting turned to one side. Mm. And you're not creating the, these imbalances as well. Yeah, I definitely have felt that uh, I, well, I used to have a two-wheel cart and would pull it, um, and pushing it was much better on my shoulders and on my back. Mm. Well, another time out coming up right now. We'll be right back. For those people who do enjoy carrying their golf bag, they like the sound of the, of the clubs rattling against each other. Um, you're saying it takes, you're using 10% more energy, which is fascinating to me that you really are expending more energy uh, and, and will have a problem at the end of the round with the idea of, you know, starting to get too tired to finish the round. Are there specific exercises that you would recommend for someone who wants to carry the back to strengthen their back so that they can carry it over a four-hour period, four-hour-plus period? Yeah, certainly. And um, it was interesting. I, I put up this this study on my social media recently, and there, there was some slight kickback on it. And because uh, I, I haven't seen a lot of the college golf in America, I, I've watched it on, online but I didn't realize a huge number of them carry their golf bags. And a, a number of people mentioned that um, a part of them going through the college system is carrying their bag as a sign of respect, which I do appreciate. And also, secondly, some people carry their bag because it's affordable. And also, some people want to burn more calories because golf is their, their main form of exercise. So if you want to burn more calories in the golf course, sure, carry your bag. Do be aware that it may affect your performance for all those reasons that we mentioned earlier. But again, I'm happy if someone wants to try and do that. So to answer your question, if you want to make yourself more resilient and and able to carry your golf bag, I'd be considering a lot of exercises carrying a weight in one hand. So an exercise which is called a a farmer's carry, uh, pretty self-explanatory as a farmer would carry a hail bale or, or something heavy, like I don't know, a tin of petrol or, or something similar, you'll walk up and down a space that you have. 20 meters is, is a great distance. Trying to carry that weight, but as you're doing that, you're trying to stabilize your body. So you don't want your body to be swinging back and forth, trying to control that weight. You want to try and stay level with your chest and your shoulders. So your shoulders should be parallel with the ground. As you're doing this, you're going to strengthen a lot of the muscles deep in around your spine. There's a muscle called your transverse abdominis, which basically acts like a corset around your spine. So by controlling that weight, you're going to strengthen that muscle there. And I see a lot of golfers that do carry their bag. It's on the side of their shoulder. It's flopping around. 
and people don't realize what the body has to do to try and stabilize that shoulder joint. So a lot of those deep muscles are working really hard, which we don't realize. So I like that farmer's carry. And also some other exercises I quite like is if you have access to, again, an exercise band, is grabbing a band, tying it to a door handle at home or at a gym, you can do the same, is just trying to rotate like you're pulling back a bow for an arrow, doing that 10 times. And what that's enable, enabling you to do is firstly, it's enabling you to move well. So you're trying to rotate your thoracic spine, the upper back. And at the same time, you're strengthening those muscles that sit close to the shoulder blades and around the chest as well. So I guess quick summary of that, it's make sure you're strengthening in terms of stability, trying to control the, the body weight and control that weight moving side to side. And then secondly, try and strengthen through rotation as well. So I, often I'll see little children carrying a backpack on their way to school and the backpacks are very heavy and they're kind of hunched over, right? You see them, you know, leaning forward, trying to hold on to the bag. And it's very similar to watching somebody carrying their golf bag where they're, they're kind of hunched over. And then when they get to do their golf swing, their their body position is a little more hunched than they should. It's not a good, stable, athletic position. Um, does, does that happen? Do, can you be creating problems for yourself when you're carrying your bag Yeah, one, to your back? 100%. And I guess our body responds to how we treat it as well. And, and our body is a product of our habits and our environment too, Fred. So like you mentioned, if you're carrying your bag, gravity's trying to pull that bag forward and down, which is going to lead into this more rounded position. And on the major tours, I can probably think of a handful of people that have that rounded posture. So Victor is probably an outlier. He's a bit more rounded with his chest. If you look at some of the, the really good golfers on the tour, so look at um, Jordan Spieth and, and Justin Thomas and uh, John Rahm, a handful of these really good players, their spine is in a really good alignment. And I'm just going to touch briefly on um, a little trip I had to Turkey. It's slightly off topic, but I went to Turkey. No, no, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Turkey and um, a part of our tour, we're going to where they make a lot of these really nice carpets. It's a part of their, their culture. So anyhow, we went to this store. There was about five or six old Turkish ladies and they walked out of the store to sell us this carpet. And anyway... With, with these ladies posh, it was essentially hunched almost to like where there were 90 degrees. Their, their chest is facing the ground. Oh. Yeah. And, and because, because they've been making carpets since they were very young, they've really adapted into this position. So firstly, the muscles will start to adapt into this position. And then secondly, the joints will start to fuse almost where they can't actually get out of that position. And that's a very extreme point of reference. But again, going back to carrying a golf bag, you want to be very mindful that you're trying to stay up tall, be very natural, uh, and, and making sure that you're not getting into these, these compromised positions. And a vast majority of my clients are between 35 to 60 years old. Most work at a desk, and I guess <laughs> the desk can be a devil, I like to say. So if you're getting mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're getting caught into that, it's not the desk. That, it's not the desk that's the devil. It's the chair. <laughs> right? That's right. That's right. So on on that note, if you are a desk worker, it's trying to get up throughout the day every hour. I'd recommend and try and reverse that sitting posture. So if you if you're sitting on your backside most of the day, I like to try and get people reaching over their head as high as they can. You're arching your back. From there, your neck's going to straighten up and you're going to be in a taller position. And then secondly, is doing a basic hip flexor stretch. So where your leg will go behind you, you should feel a stretch on the front of your hip. And it's just trying to reverse what you've been doing for the, the last number of minutes or hours. Interesting. Interesting. Right, let's find out what's happening on Golf Smarter Mulligans this week. And then we'll take another, it's a brief timeout. And then a couple more questions for our last segment. We'll be back in a moment. This week on Golf Smarter Mulligans is part two with Wall Street Journal columnist John Paul Newport 
commenting on his piece called Golf's Biggest Delusions, Nine Things That People Say About Golf That Isn't True. We got into one of my favorite topics to discuss on the golf course, and that's questioning why we need to get our egos in the way and make the game even harder than it already is. This tee it forward movement, uh, which is out there now that the USGA and the PGA of America are pushing is absolutely brilliant. The idea is you want to play from the tees that create the approach shots into the green that are the most fun to have, which would be the approach shots where you're using the same club that maybe the pros would be using into their greens. On a long par four, most of the pros are using pitching wedges to eight irons into the greens. To have the maximum amount of fun, the greens are created to accept shots with a wedge or a nine iron or a seven iron at the most. And so you're going to have a lot more fun. You'll be a lot less frustrating if you're hitting shots into greens with the appropriate clubs those greens were designed for. You're going to be more likely to get on the green, have birdie putts, you know, have reasonable pars. So you figure out where the tees you should be playing are to give you those type of shots. And for most people, it's way further forward than where they tend to play. That's episode 234 of Golf Smarter Mulligans featuring John Paul Newport being featured on our podcast offspring, Golf Smarter Mulligans, being released this Friday morning. Originally published as a members-only episode in March of 2012, which means that even if you've been listening for more than a decade, chances are you've never heard it before. So if you're entertained by what we present here each week, then don't miss the chance to get two episodes every week of Golf Smarter, the longest-running golf podcast that proudly focuses on making us better, smarter golfers. And Golf Smarter Mulligans, episodes from our archives that revisit the best of Golf Smarter that can't be found on any podcast platform anymore. They're both available for free from wherever you're listening right now. Let's talk about hydration and nutrition on the golf course, right? Critically important. And when I'm talking hydration, I don't mean let's go get another beer or crack open a bottle of wine. I played with these guys. This guy was in the Mm -hmm. wine industry, but they had a couple beers and then they had a bottle of wine. Uh, I was like, wow. They're like, you don't want any? I'm like, no, I can't drink on the (laughs) golf course. Um, I can't drink alcohol on the golf course. But very curious um, what you recommend to, you know, keep the wheels from falling off the, at the end of the round. And I think that hydration and nutrition are critical to that. Help me out. Well, 100%. And hydration and nutrition, again, many golfers don't think about, but it's these, these small things that you can do that add up in the long run. And they might be 1%, 2 or even 10%. As I, I think, like you mentioned, it's, it's a huge part that's commonly missed, Fred. So with a lot of clients that I deal with, uh, firstly, we touch on hydration. And the Australian Institute of Sport here, they're, they're a big body that does a lot of research for sports performance here in Australia. So their recommendation about water intake is roughly... 750 milliliters to 1.5 liters per hour and wow. when i tell people yeah when i tell people that it normally blows their mind and uh, again it's a, a big range as well so let's say if we bring that back to golf i would suggest roughly four liters throughout your round which might be four big bottles of water and the reason we we say that is because when you're walking when you're swinging a golf club you're consuming energy and with that, the muscles are basically burning burning this energy and they're consuming salts as well. Also, the other thing that's going to happen when you play golf, you're going to sweat most likely. So to make sure that we're getting the best performance, we need to firstly, A, replace that, that water that we're losing through sweat, and then secondly, replacing the salts as well. So my advice around that is making sure you take your four liters with you. If you haven't got access to taps on your course, pack more in your golf bag if you do have taps consistently filling it up and secondly with that to make sure that you're getting salts into your body you need some sort of sports supplement or take some mineral salts with you or you can pre-mix it in your bottle of water and i'm not talking about the table salt which is typically just sodium we need (laughs) we need the the pure rock salts so with that you have a number of different salts such as sodium potassium chlorides 
to make sure that you're replenishing a lot of the salts that you lose. And when our muscles are contracting, there's basically a salt channel that's working. So if that salt channel is upset, that's going to lead to things such as cramping, more fatigue, dizziness, all those sorts of factors because your body's essentially telling you, do something about this because otherwise I'm going to start shutting down. Mm. So that is a really important factor. And touching on, on nutrition now, uh, when we're, again, playing golf, we're using a lot of muscles, we're expending energy, so we need to make sure we're trying to keep that keel even. And there's a really good book out there called Hole-in-One Nutrition, which was written by Dr. Robert Yang, a very good book, so I'll plug that. And what Robert talks about in the book is maintaining a solid or a stable blood sugar level. And what blood sugar is, it's basically your body processing glucose, which is a, a form of sugar. And with this, what I commonly see, people will not eat for nine holes, so the blood sugar starts to dip quite low. They'll get to the halfway house, they might have a sandwich, they might have a chocolate bar, they might have a can of, of cola, and all of a sudden that sugar spikes up again. So they might get this big hit of energy. Then they'll get to the 14th, 15th hole, the energy starts to drop down again. There's so, a crash. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a crash. And imagine trying to close out a good round, Fred, when you've got dehydration in play, your salt balance is out of order. You've also got hunger going on in a, a decrease in your blood sugar. And all of a sudden, you're trying to sink this four-foot putt to have your PB score. So again, the, these 10 percenters all add up. So what you should have in your golf bag is A, a fat source. So I like to pack in nuts or some sort of muesli bar to make sure that you're keeping your fat intake there. Secondly, I like to have a form of carbohydrates. So I think really easy ones are fruit, like a fresh banana. Uh, I like sandwiches, so using a good multigrain or whole grain bread. White bread, it's typically absorbed a bit faster, so I wouldn't recommend that for golf. And then thirdly is having some sort of protein source as well. So I really like to have a beef jerky. Uh, you can have some sort of protein supplement in a shake or a bar. But again, these little things, it takes you five minutes to prepare for this and put it in your golf bag. And a lot of clients I typically see, after implementing this, they say, I just feel so much better. And it also, it's after a round as well. Yep. You're, not, you're not flopping on the couch after your 18 holes. Yep, yep. Peanut butter pretzels, one of my all-time favorites. Um, peanut butter, Beautiful. peanut butter, jelly sandwich, wheat bread, little banana on it. All one of my favorites. Um, it, it, yeah, and just grazing. For me, it's just grazing through the entire round versus having something at the turn at the halfway house. Um, but just constantly taking little bits and pieces at a time through the entire round, I think, makes a, makes a big difference. What are your thoughts about, you know, these drinks that have a lot of, that supposedly replaces your electrolytes? Things like Gatorade these sugary things <laughs> oh you're laughing that's not good <laughs> <laughs> and um i guess those companies do a great uh, great lot of work to market themselves and they're associated with a lot of different sports teams so when a lot of consumers think of hydration they think of gatorade powerade they, these mammoth companies i will note with those with those sports drinks a lot of them have a lot of sugar so if, if weight management is a goal of yours, you need to probably consider that. Mm. What I'm a big proponent of is if you're going to go with one of those sports supplements because they're easy, they're there, they're in every or most pro shops that I see, I'd probably say mix it with a bit of water mm. just to make sure that you're not consuming that big whack of sugar in one hit or buy, buy a tub of it and mix it yourself because, again, if you're having that big whack of sugar, we're going to upset that, that um, blood sugar level which is going to affect how we, again, concentrate and play. Or the other suggestion I like is, is back to that mineral salts. So mixing in those salts in your water, you're going to have a pretty similar outcome to what it is drinking one of these typically very sugary and also expensive sports supplement company products. Mm, fascinating. And all of that w is, is part of the injury prevention program that you should develop. There's there's different things that you can do. One of them, of course, is staying hydrated um, and keep your nutrition up. But what are other 
injury prevention suggestions do you have? Yeah, so back uh, what we mentioned about back pain injury, there's a number of things that's going to help prevent this from happening. So I think first and foremost is having a regular exercise routine like yourself, Fred. So I think that's a great idea to do what you enjoy, whether it's swimming, whether it's walking, and having some sort of form of resistance as well. So what we know from resistance exercise, whether that's with weights or a band or with your body weight, you can basically prevent one-third of all sports injuries from occurring or also overuse injuries such as tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, we can practically halve those amount of injuries by doing resistance exercise. So I typically like three times a week, a lot of my clients, I give them a 30-minute workout and that's enabling them to build resilience, get stronger, hit the ball further, but obviously prevent injury. The second thing I need to mention as well is golfers, we love to practice. And I'm a golfer myself. I sometimes get carried away when I watch a YouTube video or I see my coach and I think, oh, I've got to, I've got to try and get those reps in to, you know, get the technique in order. Or uh, I might have a really average round, and I'll get home. I've got a net in my backyard, so I'll hit, you know, fifty or hundred balls into a net. But what that's going to do, it's going to spike your activity levels. And there's something that we call in sports medicine world, it's called the acute to chronic workload ratio. And in layman's terms, it basically means what have you done in the last month? versus what have you done in the last week. So let's say me, for example, I play golf once a week, 18 holes. If next week I go and play 36 holes, I've essentially doubled my workload ratio, which is a really big risk of injury. With that, with that workload, we want to keep it roughly 30% within that, within that variable. So for me, instead of playing 36 holes, playing 27 I might be able to get away with even slightly less than that. But I guess to note, if you go from one range session a week to three or four, I would probably expect some sort of ache or pain to occur. And with our body, we like homeostasis, which means we like to keep things stable. If we see these really big spikes or drop-offs in your activity level, it can be expected to run into injuries of some sort. And the other big thing I'll, I'll mention on is some swing characteristics as well that, that can cause injury. So the first big one, um, and it's very heavily debated, is early extension, which is practically where the hips get closer towards the ball prior to impact. From here, it puts our body in a position where our back is arching, it's side bending, and also we're rotating at the same time which puts the back tissues, particularly on the trail side, in a lot of stress. So that is one position I like to see controlled. The second position I see quite a lot of is the over-the-top move, so where people look like they're cutting wood versus the, the lead hip starting to rotate first. And another big injury area I see in the golf swing is the, the dreaded chicken wing. So... What happens in the chicken wing, instead of that lead arm starting to straighten and extend, it starts to flex. As our arm starts to bend, the muscles in our elbows have to control the club face even harder, which over time can lead into stress, in particular, uh, tennis elbow. Fascinating. This is really uh, important information, Billy. I really appreciate uh, you reaching out and, and coming on and sharing with us um, so much of what you've learned and, and what we now know, um, that we've got a long way to go and it will improve your golf game. That's the bottom line to all this. These, these type of exercises and drills and insights will definitely help your golf game. How can people find out more about you, Billy? Thank you, Fred. I do appreciate the time and, and thank you for putting a lot of work in, into what you do. And again, over 900 podcasts is a great achievement. So I do thank you for sharing your information. And of course, and for people that want to find my stuff, I'm on Instagram at golf underscore physio underscore Oz, A-U-S, that is spelled. And my website is golfphysiotherapyaustralia.com. There's tons of free stuff. Um, there's a, a free mobility guide there. So get in contact. and I'd love to help anyone out. 
So I've been traveling the last few weeks, and I got a chance to be a guest at Congressional outside of Washington, D.C. Had to borrow clubs from the course and wasn't a huge fan of what they gave me. I'm not going to mention the make. It was just my preference, and I really could not get comfortable with the putter they gave me. Oh, well. Anyway, we played the famed blue course, and even playing from the whites was a huge challenge. <laughs> Luckily, we played in short-sleeve weather. As it rained the following day and the temperature dropped each day the rest of the week, I guess that's going to happen in mid-October, right? Well, as uh, long as you stay in the fairway, you have a chance to score well. But you hit the ball into the rough, and it is thick and punishing. I did have one good stretch of five holes from five to nine that went par, bogey, par, birdie, par. And the birdie was pretty awesome. So uh, 43 on the front was quite respectable, but the back really did me in and I shot a 56. So I was really happy to break 100, but haven't been that close to triple digits in a couple of years. But I was having too much fun, so I didn't care. We had a great caddy who retired from being, this is a great story, he retired from being an attorney 22 years ago and then became a full-time caddy. It, he and no, here, here's the deal. Now I could have recorded a conversation with him, but that was the best story, so it really wasn't worth it. So anyway, he and his wife, who was also an attorney, had a coin flip to see who was going to stay home with the kids, and he won. <laughs> so he became a caddy and says that he's a much happier person because of it, and he's a good caddy. I want to thank this week's newest Golf Smarter ambassador, longtime listener, and regular email buddy. Pam Johnson of Tallahassee, Florida. Thank you, Pam. For her participation on the podcast, Pam chose to receive the glove and glove storage compartment from our friends at redroostergolf.com. It's a unique glove subscription service that offers a tremendous amount of styles and sizes to fit everyone's needs. And now they have much more than just gloves. So please check them out at redroostergolf.com. All Pam did to receive this gift was take less than one minute to call our toll-free Golf Smarter listener line and record the week's show opening. You're invited to be one of our ambassadors, too, please. And when you do, you'll have a choice of a free gift. Check out today's show notes to see more on and the links for each of the gifts. Um, that you can choose from, whether you get Tony Manzoni's video, a box of Odin X1 balls with a Golf Smarter logo, or that glove and glove storage compartment from redroostergolf.com. So, if you write to me and you have a question or a comment or a suggestion, don't be surprised when I write back with an answer and a plea to open a future episode. To see and hear highlights of the podcast interviews that we're doing, please follow us at Golf Smarter on YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and X, formerly known as Twitter, for our ongoing posts of videos and articles done five times every week. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for upcoming episodes, please write to Golf Smarter Podcast at gmail.com or click on the Hey Fred button when you visit golfsmarter.com.